my experience is with people that we're probably running at about 51% of our capacity. Something, I mean, you can think about this yourselves. I often ask undergraduates how many hours a day you waste or how many hours a week you waste. And the classic answer is something like four to six hours a day. You know, inefficient studying, uh, watching things on YouTube that not only do you not want to watch, that you don't even care about, that make you feel horrible about watching after you're done, that's probably four hours right there. You know, and you think, well, that's 20, 25 hours a week, it's 100 hours a month, that's two and a half full work weeks, it's half a year of work weeks per year. And if your time is worth $20 an hour, which is a radical underestimate, it's probably more like 50, if you think about it in terms of deferred wages. If you're wasting 20 hours a week, you're wasting $50,000 a year. And you are doing that right now. And it's because you're young, wasting $50,000 a year is a way bigger catastrophe than it would be for me to waste it because I'm not gonna last nearly as long. And so if your life isn't everything it could be, you could ask yourself, well, what would happen if you just stopped wasting the opportunities that are in front of you? You'd be, who knows how much more efficient? 10 times more efficient, 20 times more efficient. That's the Pareto distribution. You have no idea how efficient, efficient people get. It's completely, it's off the charts. Best thing you can do is teach people to write because there's no difference between that and thinking. And one of the things that just blows me away about universities is that no one ever tells students why they should write something. It's like, well, you have to do this assignment. Well, why are you writing? Well, you need the grade. It's like, no. You need to learn to think because thinking makes you act effectively in the world. Thinking makes you win the battles you undertake and those could be battles for good things. If you can think and speak and write, you are absolutely deadly. Nothing can get in your way. So that's why you learn to write. It's like, and I can't believe that people aren't just told that. It's, it's, it's like, it's the most powerful weapon you can possibly provide someone with. And I, I mean, I know lots of people who've been staggeringly successful and watched them throughout my life. I mean, those people, you don't want to have an argument with them. They'll just slash you into pieces. And not in a malevolent way. It's like, if you're going to make your point and they're going to make their point, you better have your points organized because otherwise you are going to look like and be an absolute idiot. You are not going to get anywhere. And if you can formulate your arguments coherently, and make a presentation, if you can speak to people, if you can lay out a proposal, God, people give you money, they give you opportunities, you have influence. Make it a schedule and stick to it. Okay, so what's the rule with the schedule? It's not a bloody prison. That's the first thing that people do wrong. They say, well, I don't like to have, follow a schedule. It's like, well, what kind of schedule are you setting up? Well, I, sh I have to do this, then I have to do this, then I have to do this, you know, and then I just go play video games because who wants to do all these things that I have to do? It's like, wrong. Set the schedule up so that you have the day you want. That's the trick. It's like, okay, I've got tomorrow. If I was going to set it up so it was the best possible day I could have, practically speaking, what would it look like? Well, then you schedule that. And obviously there's a bit of responsibility that's gonna go along with that because if you have any sense, one of the things that you're gonna insist upon is that at the end of the day, you're not in worse shape than you were that, than at the beginning of the day, right? Because that's a stupid day. If you have a bunch of those in a row, you just dig, you know, you dig yourself a hole and then you bury yourself in it. It's like, sorry, that's just not a good strategy. It's a bad strategy. So maybe, 20% of your day has to be responsibility and obligation, or maybe it's more than that, depending on how far behind you are. But even that, you can, you can ask yourself, okay, well, I've got these responsibilities. I have to schedule the things in. What's the right ratio of responsibility to reward? And you can ask yourself that, just like you'd negotiate with someone who is working for you. It's like, okay, you gotta work tomorrow. Okay, so I want you to work tomorrow. And you might say, okay, well, what are you gonna do for me that makes it likely that I'll work for you? Well, you could ask yourself that, you know. So maybe you do an hour of, of responsibility and then you play a video game for 15 minutes. I don't know, whatever turns your crank, man. But, you know, you have to negotiate with yourself and not tyrannize yourself. Like you're negotiating with someone that you care for, that you would like to be productive and have a good life. And, and that's how you make the schedule. It's like, and then you look at the day and you think, well, if I had that day, that'd be good. Great. 
you know, and you, you're useless and horrible, so you'll probably only hit it with about 70% accuracy, but that beats the hell out of zero, right? And if you hit it even with 50% accuracy, another rule is, well, aim for 51% the next week, or 50.5% for God's sake, or because you're, you're gonna hit that position where things start to loop back positively and spiral you upward. Well, and if we all got our act together collectively and stop making things worse, because that's another thing people do all the time, not only do they not do what they should to make things better, they actively attempt to make things worse because they're spiteful or resentful or arrogant or deceitful or, or homicidal or genocidal or all of those things all bundled together in an absolutely pathological package. If people stopped really, really trying just to make things worse, we have no idea how much better they would get just because of that. So there's this weird dynamic that's part of the existential system of ideas between human vulnerability, social judgment, both of which are, 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 are major causes of suffering, and the failure of individuals to adopt the responsibility that they know they should adopt. It isn't merely that your fate depends on whether or not you get your act together and to what degree you decide that you're going to live out your own genuine being. It isn't only your fate. It's the fate of everyone that you're networked with. And so, you know, you think, well, there's nine billion, seven billion people in the world. We're going to peak at about nine billion, by the way, and then it'll decline rapidly. But seven billion people in the world, and who are you? You're just one little dust moat among that seven billion. And so it really doesn't matter what you do or don't do, but that's simply not the case. It's the wrong model because you're at the center of a network. You're a node in a network. Of course, that's even more true now that we have social media. You'll, you know, you'll know a thousand people at least over the course of your life. And they'll know a thousand people each. And that puts you one person away from a million and two persons away from a billion. And so that's how you're connected. And the things you do, they're like dropping a stone in a pond. The ripples move outward and they affect things in ways that you can't fully comprehend. And it means that the things that you do and that you don't do are far more important than you think. And so if you act that way, of course, the terror of realizing that is that it actually starts to matter what you do. And you might say, well, that's better than living a meaningless existence. It's better for it to matter. But I mean, if you really asked yourself, would you be so sure if you had the choice? I can live with no responsibility whatsoever. The price I pay is that nothing matters. Or I can reverse it and everything matters. But I have to take the responsibility that's associated with that. It's not so obvious to me that people would take the meaningful path. You know, when you say, well, nihilists suffer dreadfully because there's no meaning in their life and they still suffer. Yeah, but the advantage is they have no responsibility. So that's the payoff, and I actually think that's the motivation. Say, well, I can't help being nihilistic. All my belief systems have collapsed. It's like, yeah, maybe. Maybe you've just allowed them to collapse because it's a hell of a lot easier than acting them out. And the price you pay is some meaningless suffering, but you can always whine about that and people will feel sorry for you. And you have the option of taking the pathway of the martyr. So that's a pretty good deal, all things considered, especially when the, when the alternative is to bear your burden properly and to live forthrightly in the world. Well, what Solzhenitsyn figured out, and so many people in the 20th century, it's not just him, even though he's the best example, is that if you live a pathological life, you pathologize your society. And if enough people do that, then it's hell. Really, really. And you can read the Gulag Archipelago if you have the fortitude to do that, and you'll see exactly what hell is like. And then you can decide if that's a place you'd like to visit, or even more importantly, if it's, a light, if it's a place you'd like to visit and take all your family and friends, because that's what happened in the 20th century. No one can live without a routine. You just forget that. If you guys don't have a routine, I would recommend, like, you get one going, because you cannot be mentally healthy without a routine. You need to pick a time to get up whatever time you want, but pick one and stick to it, because otherwise you dysregulate your circadian rhythms and they regulate your mood. Plan a life you'd like to have. And, and you do that partly by referring to social norms. That's more or less rescuing your father from the belly of the whale. But the way, other way you do that is by having a little conversation with yourself about 
as, as if you don't really know who you are because you know what you're like. You won't do what you're told. You won't do what you tell yourself to do. You must have noticed that. It's like you're a bad employee and a worse boss. And, and both of those work, you know, for you. You don't know what you want to do. And then when you tell yourself what to do, you don't do it anyways. You should fire yourself and find someone else to be. But, but you know, my point is, is that you have to understand that you're not your own servant, so to speak. You're someone that you have to negotiate with. And that's, and you, you're someone that you want to present the opportunity of having a good life to. And that's hard for people because they don't like themselves very much. So, you know, they're always like cracking the whip and then procrastinating and cracking the whip and then procrastinating. And it's like, God, it's so boring and such a pathetic way of spending your time. I think what you have to do, and, and this is part of humility, is you have to look around you within your sphere of influence, like the direct sphere of influence, and fix the things that announce themselves as in need of repair. But one of the main reasons that people don't get what they want is because they don't actually figure out what it is. And the probability that you're going to get what would be good for you, let's say, which would even be better than what you want, right? Because, you know, you might be wrong about what you want easily. But maybe you could get what would really be good for you. Well, why don't you? Well, because you don't try. You don't think, okay, Here's what I would like if I could have it. And, and I don't mean, I don't mean in a way that you manipulate the world to force it to deliver you goods for status or something like that. That isn't what I mean. I mean something like, imagine that you were taking care of yourself like you were someone you actually cared for. And then you thought, okay, I, I'm caring for this person. I would like things to go as well for them as possible. What would their life have to be like in order for that to be the case? Well, people don't do that. They don't sit down and think, all right, you know, let's, let's figure it out. You're, you've got a life, it's hard, obviously. It's like three years from now, you can have what you need. You gotta be careful about it. You can't have everything. You can have what would be good for you, but you have to figure out what it is, and then you have to aim at it. Well, my experience with people has been is, if they figure out what it is that would be good for them, and then they aim at it, then they get it. And it's strange because they don't nest, it's a strange thing. It's not quite that simple because, you know, you may formulate an idea about what would be good for you. And then you take 10 steps towards that and you find out that your formulation was a bit off. And so you have to reformulate your goal. You know, you're, so you're kind of going like this as you move towards the goal. But a huge part of the reason that people fail is because they don't ever set up the criteria for success. And so since success is a very narrow line and very unlikely, the probability that you're going to stumble on it randomly is zero. And so there's a proposition here and the proposition is, if you actually want something, you can have it. Now the question then would be, well, what do you mean by actually want? And the answer is that you reorient your life in every possible way to make the probability that that will occur as certain as possible. And that's a sacrificial idea, right? It's like, you don't get everything. Obviously, you, obviously. But maybe you can have what you need. And maybe all you have to do to get it is ask. But the asking isn't a whim or, or today's wish. It's like, you have to be deadly serious about it. You have to think, okay, like I'm taking stock of myself. And if I was going to live properly in the world and I was going to set myself up such that being would justify itself in my estimation, and I don't mean as a harsh judge, exactly what is it that I would aim at? Sit on your bed one day and ask yourself, uh, what's, what remarkably stupid things am I doing on a regular basis to absolutely screw up my life? And if you actually ask that question, but you have to want to know the answer, right? Because that's actually what asking the question means. It doesn't mean just mouthing the words. It means you have to decide that you want to know. You'll figure that's out so fast, it'll make your hair curl.